I want to introduce Robert Corteau and Dr. Toby Kears, and uh, they're going to have a discussion um, about the awesome science that's happening uh, under under uh, her watchful eye, and I guess her hands too. She's doing the research, so I'm going to turn this over and sign off. So, uh, if you guys want to take over, that would be awesome. Yeah. So, welcome everyone on this uh, fine Tuesday morning. Uh, my name is Robert Corteau. Um, as it's introduced by Trent, I'm a member of NAMA and founder of thinkfungi.org, which is a producer of mushroom-related events and courses. I'll be your webinar host today, um, but I am excited to introduce our guest, Dr. Toby Kears of the Society for Protection of the Underground Networks, or SPUN. Uh, Dr. Toby Kears is originally from Vermont, but is now a professor of evolutionary biology at VU University Amsterdam, where she's also acts as the university research chair. Dr. Kears won an Emoto Award for Unfettered Science and the 2021 E.O. Wilson Award for Natural History. She co-founded SPUN with Dr. Colin Averill, another award-winning scientist, and has recently returned from their first project in Chile's Patagonia region. With that short bio complete, I'll hand the reins over to Dr. Kears. Great. Thank you so much, Robert and Trent. Yes, and it's great to, uh, to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and... Um, and walk everyone through a bit of what we're doing at SPUN, but also what we're doing um, in my lab at the, uh, at the Free University in Amsterdam. Um, so I'm calling this talk Underground Astronauts because I think one of the big things that we're trying to achieve at SPUN, so SPUN again stands for the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks, is really get the public and mycologists and policymakers to focus on what's happening under our feet and the fungal networks under our feet. And so we're really trying to encourage more underground exploration and have people start to see the underground in the way that you would start to see space, for example. Now, in my lab, we have been developing techniques for the last couple of years to actually really try to understand the flows and the architecture of what are called our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. So this is the main type of fungi that tend to associate with anywhere between 60 and 80% of all plant species uh, where they actually penetrate the root and form a, a structure inside um, a host called an arbuscule and then form this beautiful network outside the roots. And that's what we're studying in my lab is these micron scale processes and what you're watching is a video in real time. So this is not sped up uh, or slowed down. This is an actual flow in a fungal network under your feet. And you can see how complex this behavior is, how dynamic it is. And this is all under fungal control. And so as we start to study these processes, we're really taken aback by just how important studying fungal behavior is in understanding underground ecosystems. Again, you can see that the flows, they go one direction, they go the other, they switch direction. And what you're seeing is the cellular contents inside these hyphae. So that's all of the, uh, or, or the, all of the or, or, orgasm, all of the fungal contents. So all of the, the, the nuclei, the mitochondria, the cellular contents. And what you're also seeing is a lot of carbon. So they're very, very um, important in terms of sequestering carbon. So a lot of the carbon that you're seeing here is in the form of lipids, lipids and fats, which the plant feeds to these fungal networks. And what we're doing in my group is actually trying to understand the language of these flows because the flows form because this is a, a symbiotic relationship. So what's happening is that the root is, is sending carbon in the form of sugars and fats down into the fungal network. And in exchange, the fungal network is foraging out into the soil and collecting phosphorus and nitrogen. And these are exchanged in what looks like a bit of a market type process. And so what we're trying to do is really understand the language of these flows. Now, why we wanna do that is because these are incredibly important ecosystem engineers. So anywhere from 30 to 50% of the living biomass of soils is made up of these mycorrhizal fungal networks. So that's, that's incredible. 50% of a living, vast, living biomass of soils made up of these trade networks. So you can understand, especially as a trained evolutionary biologist, how interesting it is to look at these patterns underground. 
Now, I think one of the things this, I don't think this slide is, is working, but what people don't realize is that a lot of the people tend to concentrate on carbon above ground. So let's say our tropical forests uh, are known as, as, as enormous carbon storage. But actually, if we look underground, that's where the vast majority of carbon is stored. So about 75% of terrestrial carbon is stored underground. Now here, what you're looking at is a 3D X-ray of this symbiosis. Um, and this is a tool that we are developing in collaboration with Christopher Topp at the Danforth Plant Center. And what you're seeing is the actual interaction in 3D space. So those white networks, that's the fungal network, that's the arbuscular mycorrhizae. And you can also see those circles. Those are the spores where the reproduction takes place. I also want you to notice that how the, the cells of the root are just packed. They look kind of like white squares. Those are the arbuscules, and that's the site of nutrient transfer between the fungal network and the, um, and the host root. And why we think these are so important, not only for carbon sequestration, but also for nutrient movement in general, is that sometimes up to as high as 80% of phosphorus inside plants first passes through a fungal network. So you can imagine that's an incredibly high amount. So if we lose these ecosystem engineers, it really, it really puts the, um, the health of above ground ecosystems on edge. And so what we try to do in my group is actually track and quantify and try to predict these underground flow patterns. And I think it's a really exciting time to be studying fungi. Um, and evolution in combination because there's this whole new field emerging called social microbiology. And that's this idea that, you know, there was this old view as microbes as sort of standalone asocial organisms. But the new view in science really sees microbes and, and fungi in particular as social actors that really form these complex networks of coordinated behavior. So trying to understand the actual selection pressures and the underlying biology behind that coordinated behavior is what is of interest to us. So again, another way of saying that, an easier way of saying that is just trying to understand how information is processed and shared across these very complex networks. Now you have to imagine if you're a symbiotic network, you have a lot of different jobs and these jobs sometimes have to be done simultaneously, right? So if you're a mycorrhizal network, first you have to create this infrastructure that actually allows you to go out into the soil and collect the resources that you need to trade. Now, second, you need to actually evaluate where to transport these resources for trade and where you're going to get the most resources in return. You then have to collect payment for those resources, ideally getting the best price that you can, and then using those, net, using those resources to make your network even bigger. And so we really don't understand how this functions in the natural world. We really don't understand the trade, con the context of how these, um, how these, um, how how the fungi is able to process all of the different information. I mean, soils are incredibly complex and heterogeneous. So how do they how do they sense the chemical, the physical, the environmental stimuli that are actually mediating this network formation and trade strategies? And so I like this picture because this is really what it feels like when we're studying the symbiosis between plant roots and fungal networks, that it's almost like, um, like a poker match, but the poker match is between sort of the best players on earth in terms of strategy. I mean, you have to imagine that this symbiosis it evolved some 450 million years ago. And so this, this has had plenty of time to be tested by natural selection. And so what we wanna to try to do is understand these different trade patterns between the plant root and the fungal network with the aim of, of keeping, understanding these strategies so we can really um, promote below ground um, conservation strategies where they're most important. And there's a picture of me in the corner, just desperately trying to get a glimpse of this poker game between the plant root and the fungal network. So one of the things that we have been trying to do in my lab is actually try to visualize trade, right? It seems quite hard, especially for underground processes. Um, because how do you go, how do you, I mean, you have to remember these fungal networks, right? They're thinner than, um, they're thinner than a spider web, right? You can barely, barely see them with your naked eye if they're growing in a Petri plate. In the soil, you really can't see them, especially the arbuscular mycorrhizae ones. So how do we visualize this kind of nutrient trade? And so here's a system that we've developed um, 
in my group. And what you're looking at is a Petri plate that contains um, a root compartment. And that's what you can see. Those are the sort of hairy white lines there. That's a plant root. And then we've got a fungal compartment. And what's interesting about the system is that the plant root survives off of carbon from the media and doesn't actually photosynthesize. And so we need this plant root because these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi they are obligate biotrophs. That's the word that we use in science to describe an organism that needs a partner to be able to survive. So it cannot survive without a host root. So it's the host root, again, that's feeding it sugars and, and fats. And so to be able to actually study these types of processes in the lab, we need to always have this intact symbiotic system. And that's what you're looking at right now. But another tool that we have developed is something called quantum dots. Now, quantum dots are fascinating, right? They're these semiconducting nanoparticles, and they fluoresce in really bright and precise colors when they're exposed to UV light. And so in my group, what we were able to do was take these, take nutrients. We took phosphorus in the form of um, a rock form of phosphorus called apatite, and actually um, were able to conjugate these quantum dots that were could be could be excited to uh, fluoresce uh, when hit with a UV source in different colors. And what this allows us to do is actually track nutrient trade through these very complex networks. And again, this is really, really new technologies that are just being developed in, in research labs. And so what we've seen uh, doing a whole series of experiments kind of starting about 10 years ago is, is really identified some of the most sophisticated trade behaviors in, in fungal networks that people didn't really, you know, at first people were skeptical. And then the more and more that you study them and, and expose these fungal networks to all types of different uh, environments, you see just how sophisticated they are. So for example, we know that these mycorrhizal networks, they're good at discriminating among plants. So for example, we would grow a plant, a, a seedling in the sun or in the shade, and the fungus would consist send more of the resources to the plant that would give more carbon, so the one growing in the sun. We know that rewarding the fungi with carbon actually triggers their cooperation, meaning that if you give them more carbon through the root system, they take up more phosphorus and nitrogen for trade. Now, fungi can do all kinds of things, as I'm sure this group knows well, but one of the things that these mycorrhizal networks can do is actually restrict the plant's own autonomy. So this is great. The fungus can actually penetrate into the root cell and then um, downregulate the genes of the host root to take up its own nutrients. So basically, the root gets this addiction on the fungi because it no longer can take up nutrients by itself because the fungi has, has essentially shut down the nutrient transporters of the root itself. Um, we also know from some work using these quantum dots that the fungi are very good at moving resources across the network to place where plant demand is higher. And that is a way to increase the value of some of these resources. Fungi also do this amazing thing uh, that we've seen in the lab several times now where they can actually take up resources and then hoard them in their network until the plant needs them and the price again goes up. So here's a picture of sort of what this fungal network looks like in the lab. And one of the things that, you know, that we've learned over the years, again, we can talk about these sophisticated behaviors, but basically, what this keeps pointing to is this idea that the fungi use their networks to redistribute resources in ways that actually increase returns from hosts. We don't really know how yet. How do they do this? And so we've started to kind of take a step back and look at the networks themselves as, as living architectures and trying to understand, well, what is the strategy? Let's say you were building a highway system between hubs of resources. What would that highway system, what would the architecture what would the topology of that network look like? And so what we've been doing is building um, a, what, what we call an imaging robot. So I've got this amazing a postdoc that works in my lab, um, Dr. Uh, Loreto Oriete Galvez, who has built this imaging robot that allows us to simultaneously uh, image 40 of these different networks and get really high resolution images of what they look like. That, that's what's put out in the screen uh, to your right, these high definition images. And then we work with biophysicists to actually 
create a pipeline to stitch all of these high resolution pictures together and form a larger picture of what the topology of the network looks like under different conditions. And so what happens is we actually start to be able to map these fungal trade routes. So we can see a uh, node by node how they're moving across this artificial landscape and what changes that kind of architecture as they move over that landscape. And so one of the things that we've noticed, again, here's one of these high resolution videos is that you can then really dive down into the network and get high resolution videos of what this network looks like. And you can see that closer to the root, you know, things really dynamic movement starts to happen. And again, you know, you've got to imagine that the root is loading sugars and fats into this network and really changing the pressures. But we're trying to understand how does the fungi actually use these complex flows to make the calculations of where to send those resources. And again, what you think if, if it looked very much like a highway, then what you would imagine is that the phosphorus is going one way up towards the host route and the carbon is going the other. Um, and you would have this simultaneous bi-directional movement. Um, and that's what happens when we've got highways, right? But usually we've got some kind of barrier in the center that breaks it up. And that's what's interesting about these fungi is that they're aseptate. So that basically means that they never, they don't have any septa to break up these, uh, these cells into compartments. So it's basically one big cellular tube. And that means that it's, it's, it's doing dynamics that you know, haven't really been seen in, in biophysics labs before. And so some of the things that we do are to try to actually follow individual particles inside this network to see how the fungi moves these particles. So that's basically what you're seeing now are individual particles tagged in a fungal network. And then we, we use this computer program that allows us to follow the tails as they move through this space. And what this allows us to do is actually extract the data about the velocity of how the just how fast the fungi is moving these particles inside the network. And again, this is really interesting to us, even from a climate change perspective, because we're, we're constantly doing climate manipulations, you know, increases in temperature, you know, simulating what happens when there's too much nutrients in the media. And it really changes the velocity and the dynamics of these uh, of these flows. And so, you know, it's particularly worrying when the flows start to slow down, for example, because you can imagine that not only is it so important that the carbon is a, is a, is a major sink um, in these networks, but also, again, up to 80% of the phosphorus for, the, for healthy plant systems is coming from a fungal network. As soon as these um, flows slow down, we have to start worrying about the effects for the above ground ecosystem. And so really what we're trying to do right now, a major push in our lab is to really establish this link between um, fungal behavior and carbon sequestration. Okay, now just for a couple of slides to tell you what we're doing at SPUN and how this relates to the work that we're doing in my lab. So I think as, as scientists, you know, we started to get a, a bit frustrated um, with constantly scientists talking to each other about all of these, these you know, climate change issues, um, but not really able to, to take a stand and to drive changes in conservation or climate agendas. And, you know, especially the degradation of soils. So this is a statistic from the UN that suggests that about 90% of soils are going to be degraded by 2050. And that's, that's, that's pretty soon. And so as scientists, we started to say, well, we've been doing this research for decades, and it's, it's not really getting out there. And what we need to do is bring together these mycorrhizal uh, scientists and other types of mycologists to understand just how important fungal systems are in, in, in climate change. And I think one of the major problems that we've been facing is that really the destruction of these fungal networks has largely been undocumented. Um, so when you see a major forest fire or you, know, you see some of these you know, climate change drivers above ground, that really catches people's attention you know, and, and enough to maybe even take a stand against it. 
Um, but really the destruction of these, of these fungal systems um, is largely undocumented. So one of our drives was to actually start documenting these changes. And so we founded SPUN um, with basically three missions. And the first was to map. And, and when we say map, like I really mean map because our audacious goal is to map the fungal networks of planet Earth and really try to understand the way that we've mapped you know, ocean currents and, and global vegetation, we really wanna map these systems underground. And, and first that means mapping the biodiversity, you know, where they are, uh, where the hotspots of biodiversity are, where are the endemic species, where are the ones being threatened. Um, but eventually, you know, uh, there is hope to be able to map the physical uh, architecture of the network as well, but that's, that's probably still decades off. So MAP is mission one, protect is mission two. Again, we really want to advocate for the protection of underground ecosystems, which are lar largely ignored in conservation agendas um, and, and require, different, require different management than let's say, you know, if, if there was a, a bird species that needed to be protected um, or a flower species that might, that might have different management practices than a fungal network underground that uh, was endemic and, and on the, let's say, IUCN red list. And lastly, we have this mission to actually be able to harness fungal networks, right? So how can we drive innovation into using these uh, as, as potential climate levers? And I really think the thing where we have to start, you know, it's hard that we have to start so far back, but really just you know, talking to enough people so that, that people understand that how much of an above ground bias we have right now and how we live in such a visual world that people really are trying to, are, are really focused on the things that they can see uh, rather than, than some of these foundational keystone uh, ecosystem engineers underground. Um, and so, yeah, you can see on the, on the right there is a, is a beautiful photo of one of these networks that we've, that we've taken. Um, and so as Robert mentioned, I, I'm about a week back from a big expedition. Um, this was our first expedition as fun um, to try to understand some of these underexplored regions. So what you're looking at right now is a map developed by an algorithm. We've got a big data science team that works on algorithms trying to predict not only where biodiversity hotspots are, but where the most undersampled regions for these mycorrhizal networks in the world are. Um, and so trying to put those together to actually identify, right? Where is the Amazon of the underground? There's a good chance that it's not in the Amazon, that it's somewhere up, let's say north in the boreal forest, um, where above ground biodiversity is not as high as, as other places, but below ground biodiversity is showing these signals of incredible biodiversity. Um, and so when we went to Chile, what we were doing was actually trying to ground truth some of our biodiversity predictions, right? So that's what you're looking at here with a map of the red spots and the blue spots. You know, we could identify using our, our machine learning algorithms where we expected these red hotspots to be. And so we'd basically be following a GPS device to go there. And then we had to compare those to what are called cold spots where we don't expect biodiversity to be as high. So as scientists, we always have to do these controls, right? So you can't just go out and measure what you think is biodiversity hotspots. You also have to compare that with, with cold spots. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Um, this is just a map that I just really to drive home a point of why we're making these maps. Um, I think I hear sound from somebody's uh, computer, but um, so we're making these maps because these di the distribution of these fungi is predicted to shift according to different climate scenarios. So for example, this is a map of Australia. We're just looking at one species of mycorrhizal fungi under a business as usual. Um, a business as usual scenario. And you can just see how intense these climate change drivers are for the distribution of these fungi. So I say that we're really making the maps to do three things, to, 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 to follow the distribution of these fungal networks under climate change, um, to be able to predict and identify where the biodiversity hotspots are so we can, we can save those. And, um, and lastly, to figure out what are the, what, what biodiversity is associated with um, above ground ecosystem parameters that we care so much about, like what, what fungal networks are associated with tight nutrient cycling or more carbon sequestration? Um, and again, to be able to answer those kinds of questions, we have to get out there and start mapping for biodiversity. 
And so that's why we started this underground explorers program. The idea is to encourage, you know, citizen scientists, uh, communities to go out and, and sample these, these fungal networks across the world. Um, obviously trying to develop such a big global program is going to take a few years. Um, so I can answer questions about that and where we are with that right now. But the idea is that we have um, a pipeline where people are able to sample soils and then the soils are kept in the country of origin. So we're not sending soils about all over the world. And as long as those samples are what we call geolocated, that they have a coordinate, a very clear coordinate and elevation attached to them, then they can help us build these global maps. And you can learn more about that at, at spun.earth. And so the idea is that, you know, what we do is want to enable really a generation of what we're calling myconauts to go out and explore the fungal communities in their own backyards. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Um, yeah, that's our website. And uh, we also have a, a Twitter account. So um, thank you so much for listening. And I'll stop the share and we can talk more. So thank you for that. That was really educational. I really enjoyed that. And you did it so quick too. Bam, bam, bam. Um, we got a few questions as you were going on, but I wanted to just let you, you know, run with it for a while there. So uh, working in order here, I suppose the first one was uh, a clarification on whether the uh, 30 to 50% of living biomass was, uh, um, was formed by uh, Arbules, uh, arbuscular fungi only or all mycorrhizal fungi? Yeah, just arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So, I mean, you can imagine, right? You start adding ectomycorrhizae to that and, uh, and other kinds of fungal networks that's gonna go up even more. I mean, we live in a fungal world, especially underground. Um, so a lot of that living biomass is, is fungi. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I and that and that differs, you know. When we say when we say you know thirty to fifty percent, I think in terms of biomass, some of the largest and for for arbuscular mycorrhizae are in grasslands by far. So if you really want to find the highest biomass of uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, look in grasslands. So that's but why I kind of, of find it. A little... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I find it kind of interesting because you guys are saying the hot spots, right? Um, but the areas that you seem to be uh, focused on seem to be the areas that. For example, don't seem to be at least at least to me like the grassland areas, right? Yeah. Um, so you're you're really focusing on these areas where, I mean, could you explain? I suppose a little bit where you're saying these are the hot spots for the diversity, but then it kind of contradicts with the whole you know the majority of it being in grasslands. Yeah. Okay. So there's two different maps. Like for example, if you look on the map that is on our website, that's the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So that's where we would expect with the herbaceous plants and uh, deciduous trees to harbor the highest levels of biodiversity. So again, hot spots more like in Mongolia um, and and um, Kazakhstan steeps, for example. Ectomycorrhizae shows a very, very, very different patterns of biodiversity. So again, boreal forests are really, really important. Um, there's parts of Chile, especially we are, we are with, um, when we were down there, we were studying these nothophagus trees. They're called a southern beech. And they're associated with some 600 different species of ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, so, so really, uh, really important um, hotspot of biodiversity there. Um, and, and what we have to stress again and again, and I think this is really important, like we, these are predictions and these are based on algorithms um, that are fed about 10,000 samples from around the world. And that's not, that, that's not global coverage, right? Like right. the first maps before our maps were based on 350 samples. I mean, you know, it's, it's starting to go a little bit faster. Um, but we, yeah, we have to be really careful about mapping things. I think as soon as people say, oh, there's a map of it, it's done. But, but no, these are predictive maps, right? So I think what, we're, what, what we really want to get across at SPUN is how important it is to ground truth these predictions, especially if they're going to be used, used rigorously in like conservation agendas and like deciding, you know, what, if we should have a fungal conservation easement, for mycorrhizal fungi, where should that be, right? We have to be rigorous about those, um, about those, those, those policy changes. And so again, yeah, these algorithms, they're really more predictions. And so that's why things like going out to Chile 
those expeditions are are so important um, because we just have to ground truth, like literally dig up the soil and figure out what is there. Do you feel like you have a, a more common general knowledge in the areas that are more, you know, uh, let's say in Vermont, that there's a, a better understanding of what's there and that's why you're kind of focusing on these other hotspots or are you focusing, you know, you don't know any, you know, you don't well, know about it anywhere, but. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, first we don't know about anywhere, right? Because you can have, I mean, soils are so heterogeneous. I mean, it's really, you can have like a desert right next to like a very productive area in the centers, you know, in terms of millimeters, even microns, you know? And so when you're studying diversity at that level, it's, it's, it's complicated <laughs> because it's, it can be so heterogeneous. Um, that said, I guess where we have the most data from are places where Western science has been studying the most, right? And so that's why we're trying to go to underexplored areas. So again, we have two maps. Well, we have lots of maps, but we have maps that are focused on biodiversity predictions from the algorithm. Um, and those are, are fed about 10,000 samples. But then we also have this underexplored map and though that was the purple map and that was showing areas um, that took two different variables into account. The first one was spatial distance from the previous sample. So again, just looking at how far it was from a known sample that's already in our database and habitat dissimilarity. So again, there's some habitats that just haven't been studied, right? So like, again, really, um, 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 you know, sort of desert ecosystems where you still have plants that, you know, are associated with mycorrhizal fungi, they just haven't been surveyed. And so again, what you can use those maps for is to drive your, your expedition um, priorities, like where, you know, if we have this limited amount of funds, where do we need to go first? And I think underexplored areas um, rather than, yeah, rather than ground truthing, you know, where we know samples have been taken and we know what's there. Um, I think we need to focus on places that haven't been sampled. So, so I guess, yeah, in, in that case, we're, we're trying to go as far out as we can. Um, Work our way in. Yeah, Jean was kind of echoing here, uh, need to be careful of diversity versus prevalence when discussing the hotspots. Well, I guess that's kind Very of one true. of the, yeah. Uh, he's also asked, uh, heard that mycorrhizal have a layer of polarized water on the periphery that can pass signals quickly. Have you investigated this? Yeah, so our, our lab is not focused on, you know, the fungal network as a, as a communication conduit. Uh, there's some great labs that are focused on that. Um, we are interested in, in trying to understand the, the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic layers across the hyphae. Um, we've got a new project that's looking at sort of the electrophysiology of, of, of how uh, the cell wall is really thick, right? So it's a very cool thing in terms of trying to understand uh, what passes through and what doesn't. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of good labs focused on that. Um, I think the only thing that I always say, and I, I love the way the question was asked because it was very, it was very, um, uh, um, uh, it was very uh, focused on, okay, this is just the fungi, it's maybe not the plants using it for communications, like what we keep stressing is that fungi are not accessories, right, that plants use, like they have their, they're under their own um, selection pressures. They've been under selection pressures for millions of years, and that means they've evolved very all of all kinds of different strategies. And so, if it helps them to, let's say, have secondary metabolites cross their their um, the outside of their hyphae, then that might be selected for. If it doesn't help them, it'll probably be selected against. So what we really do is try and take like a, um, a fungal vantage point on these types of, of physiological questions and say, okay, well, yeah, does it benefit the fungi? And if, if so, how? Um, because then I think we can really get at them as, as drivers, you know, do they benefit from these types of communication um, or, or not? Because I don't think they're passive accessories. That's the thing we feel very strongly about. Yeah, I think everyone in this community would agree with that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, Betty asked a question here, is, is anything known generally about the abundance of fungal networks in cultivated agricultural soils? Oh yeah, oh, there's, there's so much amazing research being done. I mean, because these, these, fung these, these fungi that, that are muscular mycorrhizae uh, associate with, with the vast majority of, of crops that we grow. I, the exceptions are like the brassicas, so like your broccolis and your cauliflowers and things like that don't, don't uh, host mycorrhizal fungi. 
um, but the others do, and and they're really important for crop nutrition. So yeah, there's I would say you know whole labs are dedicated to just studying these in a particular cropping system, like in rice or in corn or in potatoes, you know. Um, and we've learned a lot. And so I think some of the the major findings are that you know tillage isn't great <laughs> for the networks. It tends to select for fungi that make lots of spores rather than thick. That rather than put you know energy into into thick thick complex networks. Um, and that means that they probably don't provide as much nutrients. Um, we know that when you add a lot of fertilizer to crops that that selects again against um, really um, um, abundant healthy networks because the plants no longer are feeding carbon to the fungi because they're, they're taking up the nutrients directly from the soil. And so again, that there that is a very strong selection pressure against the fungi surviving in those habitats. Uh, fungicides are obviously incredibly dangerous because uh, they just directly kill um, the mycorrhizae. Um, but yeah, I think one of the main things that we're we're looking forward to is for breeders to start incorporating, you know, the symbiosis more into breeding programs. There's a lot of work showing that domestication of different crop species really disrupts the symbiosis, especially when crops are bred in very high nutrient uh, soils. And so a lot of work now is trying to figure out, okay, well, everybody knows that they're important and they're great for in terms of sustainable um, uptake of nutrients. They're very important for leaching. Yeah. So they can decrease leaching by up to 40%. So if you're adding nutrients and they are there, then they stop them from getting into the water. So how do we breed crops that actually engage in a healthier uh, relationship with these mycorrhizal fungi? Um, do we go back to centers of origin of some of these crops and see which you know, which, which mycorrhizae they tend to associate with. Um, we have a project going to Ecuador, for example, this summer that's looking at mycorrhizal, uh, I think it's alpha diversity in cropping systems and then adjacent forests and trying to understand, okay, well, what is the filter coming in from natural communities uh, into the agricultural fields and, and is that helpful? Um, and so, yeah, long answer, but great question because they're, they're incredibly important, but people know they're important, right? I think the only thing that we are also a little bit hesitant by is that, you know, um, this idea of sort of inoculation, um, it's complicated because a lot of companies are sort of advocating for, oh, this is a sustainable way of, of getting nutrients and, and they're right. Um, but what I worry about is that we're sort of repeating the issues of, of the green revolution, but again, underground, right? And we're just gonna inoculate with one strain of fungi. And, and again, we just become reliant on this one sort of powerhouse that may evolve to be less mutualistic or you know, less beneficial than we had initially thought. So, um, so yeah, we're really advocating for, for inclusion of mycorrhizae in agricultural systems. But in a smart way that, you know, that how can we actually do management practices that support the, the abundance and diversity of, of networks rather than inoculating, you know, the earth soils with one strain of, of fungi, which I think we all agree wouldn't be ideal. Right. Well, there was a bit of a follow up question on this, which was, uh, you know, with regards to the, your, your slide there on the 90 percent of uh, soil will be degraded by 2050, um, if you know kind of what uh, what the context is uh, what, what is the degrading do you know what degraded soil yeah means? yeah yeah no it's a good question it's a good question so it's a statistics out by the un so i'm happy to share the link it really goes goes into quite a long definition of what it means to be a degraded soil um and it has all kinds of factors you know from everything from organic content which may vary depending on the soil type anyway all the way to um yeah uh, heavy metals and 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 chemicals um, and so I'm happy to share a link, but, but several different factors combined. So again, I mean, I'm in this, I'm in this, you know, academic world where we could spend a week, you know, debating what defines a healthy soil, <laughs> what defines a degraded soil, right? So we have to be very careful with language, but because this one came from the UN, it's backed up by a lot of, a lot of good, good science that, that we believe in, but yeah, using terms like that can be hard, right? Especially, to, I think healthy is even harder to tell you the truth, right. like defining what is a healthy soil. Well, there's, always, 
<laughs> There's always so much debate about what that what that means. I'd like to define it from a fungal point of view, right? Like I can't imagine like <laughs> calling a soil healthy if there's not this huge, uh, you know, abundance of of um, of mycorrhizal fungi. But again, that that's not that's not what a lot of other people feel. So um, we have to leave those terms a bit vague. I think. Fair enough. Um, another question is, are you ever looking specifically at orchid mycorrhizal relationships, perhaps with endangered species? Yes, yes. Oh my goodness, the orchid mycorrhizae are just like, yeah, some days I think about just waking up and only studying orchid mycorrhizae, because it'd be a lot easier to map the world of orchid mycorrhizae, you know, still hard, but it would be a lot easier. Um, so yeah, we work with scientists. Uh, Vincent Merricks is this amazing scientist here in, um, in, in the Netherlands who works at Naturalis, who is, is doing this global survey of um, global survey of these of these uh, specifically of, of orchid associated uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And yeah, uh, trying to understand about yeah, what these mycoheterotrophs, right? So these plants again that don't photosynthesize, um, that can tap into the fungal network and actually steal carbon rather than give it. Um, and so, you know, from an evolutionary vantage point, that's some of the most interesting questions that we that we have because, like, you know, if that if that that's such a great strategy from a plant point of view of of you know just being able to siphon off small amounts of carbon and not put lots of energy into photosynthesis. So, um, so yeah, don't worry, the orchid mycorrhizae are not off the list, um, but in terms of making, in the aracoids too, right? So we talk about four major types of mycorrhizae, our vascular mycorrhizae, the ectomycorrhizal fungi that are associated with like conifers uh, in general, except in Patagonia where it's kind of the opposite, um, and, um, and then aracoids in the aracaceae family, and then and then the orchid mycorrhizae. Um, aracoid and orchid mycorrhizae are just, there's just not a lot of data in terms of geolocated samples, right? So, so again, um, sampling in places like Borneo are really, really important because a lot of these plants are just associating with this type of fungi, right? The specificity is so high. So if you have to, uh, if you want to save the plant, you definitely have to save the fungi as well. Jonathan asked, could you please interpret the orange blue global map for us? Which colors indicate high biodiversity and which one's below? Um, okay, so I just have to look back at my map. So was I, I think I, the only map that I showed was the underexplored map. Um, so again, that was the map that was kind of bluish and purplish. Um, is, is that the one he's talking about? Because those are the two variables, again, that I was talking about. Um, this idea of of um, yes okay yeah of under undersampled in space so um, we know that um, we know where our ten thousand samples were already taken from so then we can do just do simple math trying to figure out okay well what is the what is the area of distance um, away from that and the further away you get from a sample the more un underexplored it becomes um, it gets even more points for underexplored when it enters into a new habitat because you have to remember so it's not just about making these maps is not just about geolocating the samples like you would you're not just like putting your favorite restaurants on a map where there's just a dot, right? So all of these algorithms, they take into account the environment. And so, and I think right now we're using about 80 layers of remote sensing information uh, to help feed these algorithms. So again, really trying to understand um, what, where habitats are different from others. Um, and, and that helps us identify habitats that are, are undersampled. So again, so putting those two things together, yeah. So essentially the map is like, the black areas of the map would be kind of the unexplored areas then? Um, no, no, so it's totally opposite. So it's oh. it's the bright areas that we want to go explore. <laughs> so sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what the question was, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now I've explained it twice and I still hadn't explained what the color code was. Bright means underexplored. So, um, so yeah, Sahara. <laughs> There's some places, you know, where, where vegetation doesn't grow, we're not going, but there, there are some amazing places in, um, 
different African countries that we need to, to explore. Um, and, uh, and obviously South America, even some places in the US, like some, some prairies that really show up for us as potentially places that need to be explored that haven't been yet. But yeah, sorry, bright colors indicate underexplored. Good, got it. <laughs> um, Shannon was asking whether Spun has the funds to support the analysis of local soil samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So eventually, I mean, you know, that's what I am doing with, you know, the vast majority of my time is 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 trying to uh, get fund foundations interested in mapping the Earth's fungal network so that we have plenty of resources to be able to map it. But yeah, of course, that's that's the goal um, is it's not so much the soil samples that that sounds really general, right? So we're not doing analysis like chemical analysis or analysis of um, organic com uh, content. It, it gets huge, nor bacterial diversity. I mean, it's just, as soon as you start taking a soil sample, there's, there's so many things that you can use it for. Um, but what we're trying to do is just extract the DNA of, of, of the mycorrhizal fungi. And then we use these specific primers um, that allow us to sequence regions of interest of just this class of fungi. In all cases, wherever the, the sample is sent, we keep a backup. So in case we do get enough funds to be able to study all fungal types or all different kinds of bacteria or different uh, you know, contents of the soil that we'll be able to do that. So in terms of sending in soil samples, the idea is eventually to have this pipeline where people can send in samples. The most important part though, is that it's not just a sample in a bag, right? There's about five steps that are really important that make this uh, sample uh, useful to us. The most important being, again, these coordinates, right? If you can't geolocate the sample, we can't put it on a map. Um, and so you need a GP, you know, I think they're on the phone now, right? I mean, everybody can kind of get their coordinates. It's not that complicated, um, but the sample has to be, has to be geolocated. And then it has to be treated in a certain way, right? And um, if you let it sit around, then those pesky molds come in and sort of overtake uh, the signal of the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so it's kind of this fine balance, like when we were in Chile, it was just the start of winter and the soils were cold and so we would sample and we'd get it back and keep it in a fridge at night and then extract the DNA. But this summer, you know, when my student, let's say, is in Ecuador and it's really hot soils, then we suggest that they're air dried as soon as possible and sent for extraction. So it's just trying to keep the DNA in the place that it was um, where you sampled the soil. So either air drying or, or, or kept, kept cold. Interesting. Um, but th that's not the future, though. Like the future, like if I could push technological developments, you know, it's uh, I don't know how much you guys are following this like idea of sequencing in the field. Like, so it's really still far off, probably a decade off, but they're developing, you know, smaller and smaller kits that were basically are allowed to extract DNA in the field and run sequencing uh, protocols actually, you know, in, in Real the time. yeah so nanopore is like a is a is a growing technology um that allows yeah for more sort of rigorous field sampling and sequencing um without having to do yeah sending it to a, a, free, a, a sequencing facility which is great because then we're talking about really about you know community empowerment right like it's not about trying to send it off to a lab and who knows what's going to happen to the sequences right like it's about keeping it in the um in the place of origin and that information being kept in the hands of the person who who um who took that sample and then hopefully you know because everything is open source and transparent that they want to be part of building this 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 map um across the world no um, just a little message to to our participants here that this will have to uh, this webinar is going to be ending in, in seven minutes here. Um, so we might not have time to answer all the questions that have come in as as, you, as Toby's been answering questions, more questions have been coming in, of course. That's, that's great. That's good. Works, that's so. what we're here for, right? I can't see everybody though, but I, it's, it's fun. I wish I could wave. But hopefully, uh, yeah. hopefully another webinar in the future and then more answers. Um, but the questions are great though. Here. Great questions though. Really, really good. It's really yeah, exciting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Porter has asked, when heavily used land is protected or restored to its original habitat, do you see reestablishment of native fungi or are these fungi prone to disappearing for good? Oh, God, I wish we knew. I really think it depends on habitat type, right? 
and just, yeah, resilience and robustness of fungal communities. Um, you know, it's not like it's it's all doom and gloom. I mean, I think we all know about, you know, how fire is, it can be very good for certain classes of fungi um, that, that are able to come in and, and uh, you know, look so degraded above ground, but there are these, you know, um, fire loving fungi that are able to come in and colonize and sort of start the process of regeneration. You know, those aren't mycorrhizal fungi, you know, with mycorrhizal fungi, you really do need a host plant. Um, and so in terms of restoration, I think, getting in the right plants is, is pretty important, you know, so on our on our website, we're really pushing for the planting of, of native plants, obviously, that's just something super simple that that can happen. But, you know, if we're talking about a land and then trying to restore it, and then eucalyptus is planted, then there's no way you're ever going to get to that fungal community. Um, I think the time scales are long, right? I've seen a couple of papers that that have sort of looked at restoration of fungal communities over time. Um, after logging events, you know, diversity, deforestation is, is pretty, pretty intense selection pressure. Um, and you can, you can, there's one paper that's suggesting that about 90% of the diversity disappeared um, in the following months after, after logging, but it comes back, right? It's decade scales, I guess I would say, but it definitely comes back. Um, I think one of the issues that we have as you know, wanting to do this biogeography of actually trying to figure out where the biodiversity is, is that we still don't even really understand how to describe biodiversity in, in, mycorrhizal, um, in mycorrhizal species or whatever. I mean, it's a little bit easy in, in ectomycorrhizal types, but with the arbuscular, they, they have a level of, of genetic differences that we might not be picking up on in our sequencing, right? So if you were to ask a biologist, how many species are there of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi? You know, I think when I was in grad school, it was like 200 and now it's gone up to like, I don't know, 500, 600, something like that. But if you actually look at, you know, how diverse these can be at a really sort of base pair level, it's really, dramatic. And those base pairs, I mean, as an evolutionary biologist, I see that means a different strategy, right? So if I talk about restoring biodiversity, it, it's it's hard to, to say what is actually lost because we, I don't think we understand the level of resolution of, of, of traits yet, you know, of like strategies and traits and what could be lost. Um, after, yeah, you know, I mean, this is, this is biodiversity that's been generated over hundreds of millions of years. So yeah, I just, let's just not, yeah, let's not lose it. <laughs> that would be the key. A little follow-up, Ken had asked, um, as we map the underground networks, uh, we'll be able to, to identify the invasive species. You see lots of folks using inoculations to move in and around the land. Ooh, that's such a great question. You mean, so as we inoculate, yeah, can we follow the movement of introduced inoculum species? I think, is that, is that, the, is that the question? Um, uh, yeah, I hope so, because that's a great question. I'd we have to do that, right? It's like looking at all kinds, I mean, you know, invasive is a hard word when we talk about mycorrhizae. I'm not sure that we use that term yet, but, you know, monocultures in agricultural fields because of inoculum, yeah, they, they really do come to dominate some fields. Um, and at SPUN, what we're interested in is it's not just about pristine habitats, right? So we really want to map managed forests and agricultural lands because, I mean, if we think about what covers what covers the earth right now, it's 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 largely managed ecosystems. And so when we build these maps, yeah, we're we're not just going to the pristine habitats, but we're also going to places, managed ecosystems, and then we'll get a, a better estimate of just how far this inoculation has gone already. Um, I know that it, yeah, these guys spread by spores as well. It's kind of unintuitive considering that they're like a soil fungi, but they make spores and they spread by the air. And so they're moving around the whole continent. We've got a project, hopefully it's been canceled so many times because of COVID, but to go to um, one of these atolls in the South Pacific, that's the furthest landmass away from any continent and trying to figure out, okay, well, what got there and you know, how was it introduced and that kind of thing. So definitely trying to study those processes. I think this is the last question. Uh, do these fungal networks exist under the ocean floor to process the nutrients for ocean flora? No, I wish that would be so cool. No, again, I mean, you know, no, as a scientist, maybe, but, but that would be very hard to imagine. So let's think about this. So they're symbiotic fungal networks, right? So they have to be fed uh, carbon and sugars from plants. So they need light 
um, to be able to have photosynthesis to feed the fungal networks. They can exist underwater though, yes? So if you look at mangroves or, or rice or you know, roots that are submerged but still have a photosynthetic top that's you know, either below the surface or right above the surface, um, the fungi can survive. Um, and there's so many other kinds of, and, you know, if I were to, yeah, second PhD in marine fungi. I mean, there are amazing different kinds of marine fungi in all kinds of ecosystems, including the deep sea. It's just that they're probably not these mycorrhizal networks um, that are symbiotic with plants. No. Yes. Well, with that, I know that you have a strict cutoff time here, so. Ew, I got to go to another meeting, but that was great fun. Um, yeah, please, please look at our website. There's tons of information there. We're uh, posting a new video of the expedition pretty soon with, uh, and it was, it was a great trip. It was with Merlin Sheldrake and Juliana Forci and Cosmo Shell, just amazing people on this trip. And um, yeah, it would on be great. On behalf of everyone here, I definitely <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Hopefully we can have you around again for you know your future projects. I'm sure there's a lot more. There's a lot more questions for you. So. Okay. I'm Great. sure it'd be wonderful to have you on again. Thank you and, so much. Uh, yeah, I recommend everyone go visit the website, yeah. spun.earth, Instagram, Twitter. <laughs> the whole LinkedIn, thing. All oh, of them. Follow them for updates. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, not, uh, it's, not, it's not my wheelhouse, but somebody is really good at keeping it up. So <laughs> there you go. Thank, go thank there you. for updates. That's what I'm going Okay, great. Right. Thank you so much, both. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm wondering if there's any.